Was there a time when the earth was moonless, and did people walk the earth? Is the moon artificial, and if so, who put it there? Was it the Anunnaki? And if they parked it there, why? Or did the Titans, the elder gods, the parents of the Anunnaki decide to plant that bad boy in a perfect location for various eclipses? Also, could the Anunnaki have taken it over? Could there have once been a lush environment like here on Earth? What if there was a trial run of human first, maybe Adam and Eve 1.0 were created on another planet? I am going to share with you ancient Sumerian scribes that claim to be written from Nibiru, translated via Oxford scholars, multiple Oxford scholars. I'm going to share pictures with you of multiple rocks that were brought back from the moon that went under a microscope and sliced in very thin layers. You can see what looks like brain neurons fossilized. I'm going to show the comparisons. And on top of that, they verified that it's a strange titanium alloy mixture. It's mainly made up of titanium. Very fascinating. I'm also going to show you a bounty of gourmet knowledge, lab results, and more in response to the questions I brought forth thus far. So I am about to drop some mind-bending, paradigm-shattering, brainstem-stimulating fringelicious findings with you right now. Make sure to fasten your seatbelts and keep your hands and feet inside the ride at all times. And as an added bonus question worth double points, I'm going to give you, the listener, a Google Plexian Synapse Simulator. Could the moon have caused the Great Flood? Has Saturn always had its rings? Did the giants, the Titans, the mothers and fathers of the Anunnaki, come from Titan? And if the moon is artificial, what proof is there? That is the million-dollar question, and I am about to give you the million-dollar answer. Now, make sure to check out this website, Alexandria.org. I'll leave the link in the video description box. Giordano Bruno, a 16th century Italian philosopher, is reputed to have written in De Immenso, and on pages 56 and 57, there are those who have believed that there was a certain time, as our mythology says, when the moon which was believed to be younger than the sun, was not yet created. The Arcadians, who dwelt not far from the Po, are believed to have been in existence before the moon. Theodorus writes in his first book that the moon had appeared a little while before the war, which was fought by Hercules against the giants. Once again, you have the Titans the Anunnaki, the Greek mythos, the Saturn, cult of Saturn, connect, Titan, the moon, that looks very habitable, looks similar to our own planet. How about the strange moons on the inner rings of Saturn, Iapetus? How about Mimas? How about the new one that is called Pan? It's not new, but it's newer to many people because it hasn't been talked about much. That thing looks like a giant face. <laughs> Seriously, like a face and a plate. A face on a plate. But Aristo Chuas, Dionysius, Chalcedonius are the first to talk in their works 
that are confirming the same. And this is ancient information. So I shouldn't say the first, but the some of the first reference points that we have access to now. There's also Gnosius that said the Arcadians were born before the moon, so they were called Proselenian, meaning before the moon. And a gentleman, Velikovsky, at varchive.org, itb slash sandsmoon.htm, discusses the same idea by noting one of the most remote recollections of mankind is in regard to the period of Earth's history when it was moonless. Mr. V also quotes everyone from Democritus and Anaxagoras to Aristotle and Apollonius, Apollonius, I probably said that name wrong, I'm sorry, of Rhodes to show that such a pre Hellenic time existed. Nanu, 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 nanu. You did not hear me mispronounce that word. I said it correctly. Just think that. Just keep telling yourself that. Those humans living at the time were called Pelasgians, Proselens, or Proselenes before the moon, and Arcadians pre deny and pre Decalion. You guys, I did spend time before this podcast working on those names, so my apologies. I know your time is very valuable, and some of you cringe when I mispronounce these names. Bear with me, no pun intended. They were said to have dwelt in the mountains. They fed on acorns, and they lived like the Aborigines. Now, Plutarch, or Plutarch, Hippolytus, Censorinus and a doubting Lucian, a doubting Lucian wrote of pre-lunar people, as did Ovid, who said that the Arcadians possessed their land before the birth of Jove, and that they are older than the moon. And then there's memories and oral traditions of a moonless earth. Various Native American tribes throughout Colombia, America, the Americas. And they talk about the earliest times when the moon was not yet in the heavens. Now, what about the Anunnaki slash Nibiru slash moon connection? Well, I have an article that I'm going to share with you in a minute that says translated from Nibiru, and this is via multiple Oxford scholars. i share that with you here in a moment. Now, also I think of the Anunnaki being referenced to oftentimes as the Watchers. If you've seen the Truman Show, the moon in the Truman Show is where the entire studio is set up. The Watchers keeping an eye over their you know, what they feel is their creation, but it really isn't. It's the manipulation of the creation. And there's a lot of really good parallels in that film. Also, what about the perfect location that the moon is, if you think about it, to keep an eye on the manipulation of creation? Once again, think about that. I mean, they're in a place that people think it's just natural to be there. It could be a perfect place to just spy on us strategically and also be a kind of like a a staging point you know if you're going to leave some supplies there and stuff and if you're a long way from home well you've got a remote location similar to what our military does here on planet earth you know i mean hawaii as an example guam these islands in the middle of nowhere yet we've got a huge military force there in presence and you know, some people think we've never been to the moon because the most of the video footage and pictures that we've seen, many of the pictures we've seen, most of the video footage, I'd say, at least from NASA, that shows the moon is fake. And I still think that we've been to the moon. And I think when we went there, 
we discovered things that were so old, ancient, above and beyond technologies that we had at that time and probably still have, even though there's probably been, most of that stuff's probably been reverse engineered. Think of the, I mean, that is my opinion, why they didn't spend, at least publicly, any more money and time going back to the moon after a certain point. Or at least even bragging about it. You know, I mean, they probably have some stuff out there now that we don't know about in conjunction with the Anunnaki already being there. Or maybe not. Maybe it's just an Anunnaki base. I would say that makes the most sense to me, and I'll tell you why. Because of all the literature and scriptures and petroglyphs, hieroglyphs, etc., all the evidence that I've been able to compile, it would make the most sense to me that the moon, if it is artificial, is a remote location for the Anunnaki. And even if it isn't artificial, I would say that it's a great remote location for the Anunnaki. And maybe they've turned it into a remote location to keep an eye on us once again. And let me give you some other points of reference and strong conversation points to the possibility of why I feel it could be a false planet, not a art, you know, an artificial planet. But before I do, here is the death of Gilgamesh. And once again, you can see this. I'll leave the link in the video description box. This was translated by various Oxford scholars. And this talks about a version from Nebru, the death of Gilgamesh. And there's various articles that are talked about being versions from Nibru. So if Nibru is off planet, and obviously Enki, Enlil, if they came from Nibru, then they came to Earth, and they manipulated us here. Well, maybe the first Adam and Eve 1.0 were actually made and formulated on Nibru. So a version from Nibru. It doesn't say a version about Nibru. It's a version from Nibru. So does this mean, hey, and if I'm wrong, so be it. Just tell me about it. If not, though, if they're talking about their home planet and what happened there, then I would say that makes more sense to the possibility that Adam and Eve 1.0, the first ones, came from their home planet, and then they were transferred here. So definitely check out this website, and then go to the Sumerian. If you type in Sumerian Oxford or Sumeria Oxford translations, this website should come up. I'll leave the link in the video description box. This is an image of one of the rocks that was brought back from the moon, this titanium alloy that looks like these strange... Now, once again, I could be wrong. This could be a stretch, but doesn't it look like brain neurons? And here, let's, let's go look at another image here. Well, this one's pulling up. You can see the rocks here, and it'll show you the minerals that they're made of and that they mainly are made up of, and it's titanium. The majority of these things are titanium. So imagine how much titanium is on the moon. There's a whole bunch of rocks. It's not just one. I mean, it's dozens, could be hundreds. And, of course, my Internet has to freeze up as we are having this conversation, even though I'm not doing a live show. It's funny how my Internet freezes up when I start getting into some good conversations. Here we go. Okay, look at this. Look at all this weird stuff inside of these rocks. I mean, what is that? And then here is an image of a neuron, of a brain neuron, the architecture of it. And then look at the outline of this picture here, which is from one of these rocks brought back from the moon. And it looks awfully similar. So one thing I've speculated before is the moon, some type of like... You know, here's let's go back to lpi.usra.edu lunar samples. I'll leave links to all this in the video description box once again. Wouldn't it be interesting if the entire shell of the moon was some type of titanium alloy nanobiotech that is designed to protect the people inside of it, those that control it? It's like an alarm system of sorts that 
if somebody tries to break in, well, this stuff will find a way to adapt and infuse into the trespasser or trespassers and cause them utter destruction and annihilation before they can get in to protect those inside. I mean, this is all just stuff that I think about, and I don't know if you guys ever think about this kind of stuff too, but it's certainly questions that I say have valid points, you know? And look at this. This is actually an image of a fossilized, or not even a fossilized, this is an image of a brain neuron. Look at the similarities here. Let's go from here to here to here. Look at that. So, look at that. It's the all-seeing eye right there. <laughs> Even in a brain neuron, you've got the all-seeing eye just looking at you. And it's got that red ruby eye, too. That's kind of cool, huh? And then look at this. What about the moon ringing like a bell? It literally rings like a bell. And it's not just NASA that says this, ladies and gentlemen. Why does the moon ring like a bell unless it's hollow or has a hollow core? And... Here's something even more intense that could point, and this is another thing that I feel makes it a very solid case to this being an artificial structure and being parked where it is via being driven there, by being piloted there, literally. And you can go to fizz.org. Team solves the origin of the moon's maskins mystery. Now, according to fizz.org and the latest scientific data, and I think this is way far-fetched, this is far more far-fetched than the answer that I have, is, or the theory that I have, they're saying that because of huge craters and enormous impacts that cause these maskins, these literally gravitational thrusters, to be formed. Yes, free air gravitational acceleration anomalies, that's what it's called, that's what they're called, over the 420 kilometer diameter Freudlich Sharonov impact basin on the far side of the moon, the color scale ranges. You can see that. But this is an image of it. But here's what's interesting. The large concentrations on the mass lurk on the lunar surface, hidden like coral reefs, yes. An unseen and devastating hazard. These concentrations change the gravity field and can either pull a spacecraft in or push it off course, sealing its fate to a crash on the face of the moon. Now, these were unwelcome discoveries in 68 because they changed the orbit of oncoming craft. I mean, this is fascinating. Really think about that. You think that's caused by giant craters or by enormous impacts? I mean, come on. Timeshare. Just think of timeshare when you think of that. Timeshare for sale. <laughs> Does the moon sound like a bell? Yes. When it hits, when something hits it, and that's another thing that's fascinating, is, well, let's go back to these maskins here. Here's another very interesting image. Look at this. The mystery is not yet over. While it's clear that the maskins exist and exert large gravitational pulls, their nature is not fully understood. There is to this day no satisfactory explanation for the lunar maskins. Mueller said, this is from solarsystem.nasa.gov news. And for those of you that say NASA says they have the answer for everything and that's how they get funded, well, I, I get it. They tell a lot of very amazing stories, <laughs> to say it nicely. And like I said, there's plenty of video footage out there to debunk a whole bunch of stuff they've came out with. And I've even done videos on debunking some of the moon landing stuff that they did, that they showed the public. But here's what's interesting. Even these guys are admitting they don't know what these maskins are there for or what they're doing. I'll tell you what they're there for. Those things are what parked the moon where it is. These maskins are what causes it to orbit the way that it does. You can also see the image, the thermal imaging of these maskins. There's five of them back here. And that's what causes this moon to be parked where it is and to have this very strange orbit where you know it's very difficult to get to the dark side of the moon unless you got a, a special satellite to send out there. Now, here's another image of the Maskins. And then let me tell you another interesting anomaly about the moon. When you see these enormous impacts, these huge craters, some of them larger in width than others, much larger diameter, 
They're all about the same depth. Think about that for a minute. Why would they all be about the same depth? Unless there is a structure underneath, a support structure underneath to reinforce the hollow core. Otherwise, you would think that a crater that had a that hit harder, that was larger, would have a deeper impact hole, would you not? The materials alone, in my opinion, combined with the maskins, are enough to prove this thing didn't get here by chance. This didn't, and it also didn't get here, in my opinion, by divine source solely. And imagine the impact this has on every form of life on the planet. In conjunction with possibly other anomalies in space and things that are here now. It just gets to be another level. Uh, it's like the onion, the conti- uh, perpetual onion layer setting. We're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. I just shared with you one of many scribes that are thousands of years older than anything in the Holy Bible, that are scribes from scribes, supposedly from Nibiru, says it right there, and you know you can say, oh, Zachariah Sitchin, it's all from him. No, that has nothing to do with Zachariah Sitchin, ladies and gentlemen. And Zachariah Sitchin, here's the interesting thing, for those of you that debunk everything he says, or say it's all debunking, he's a, he's a CIA Freemason, you know, so nothing he says is true. Well... <laughs> A lot of the stuff that he's came out with, and I haven't even read more than a few pages of one of his books, but from what people are telling me, and from the little bit that I do know about him, from what I've read on the internet, because I have read some of his stuff on the internet, but actual books, I've read less than 100 pages of one of his books. And much of what he has written down about correlates with much of these Oxford scholars that give people... You know, isn't it awesome that these guys have put this on the internet for people to look at and study themselves? I think it's fascinating. So, giant maskins, gravitational thrusters, these could literally be... If, if they've learned how to manipulate time and space from their technologies, then using gravi- gravity and frequency in conjunction with other bodies and planets and frequencies would be the best way to move something of this size, of this caliber. And I can also explain how the giant moons, Iapetus and Mimas, which look like death stars, literally, were most likely built. The type of technology that they used is similar to what you would see here on a, a giant greenhouse built with tetrahedron truss technologies. Now, Richard Hoagland, whether you love him or hate him, I think he's got some great information out there. I certainly don't agree with everything he says, but I've had him on the show once before. It was a great interview, one of the most popular interviews of all time on Leak Project. And his research into Iapetus, in my opinion, is second to none. He, he did the absolute best research on Iapetus, pointing to the Death Star connections. And once I figured that out, I thought to myself, this is just incredible. Because if you look at Iapetus and the fact that it's got a... You know, let's let's jump into Iapetus for a minute. Heck, I just I just showed you my reasoning to think that the moon that we're looking at right now, our own moon, Luna, is a artificial Iapetus Death Star moon. Let's go to Iapetus here real quick. I wonder if the internet will let me do it here. If I'm no 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 no, be the ball, be the ball, be the ball. All right, so look at this moon with a view, moon with a view. So you zoom in here. Okay, this is Iapetus, and it, for those of you that don't know the details about Iapetus, it, it orbits the inner rings of Saturn. It's got a 10-mile high, 10-mile wide ridge, you can see it right there in the center, that goes around the entire circumference of the moon. On top of that, it's got this huge blast site right here, you can see, clearly, which correlates with the blast site of the Return of the Jedi, Death Star. That's where they have to rebuild it. And then you can see this incredible anomaly here, which looks like it's six-sided. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's not the circle here, but it's six-sided. And what I've speculated before, folks, is this could be some type of CERN-type technology, this ridge that goes around the entire moon, and then the blasting mechanism would be up here just like in the Death Star. I mean, is that just by chance? Seriously? Do you guys really think... That is just 
by chance. Um, and then you've obviously got this really cool deal here where you've seen those over a billion year old artifacts that came from mines in South Africa, gold mines in South Africa that are over a billion years old that look like Death Stars too. And I mean, just, just incredible possibilities. But, you know, I mean, the possible, just if you really think about it, and then you, you wake up one day and, you're, and you never really think, oh man, I wonder if the moon's artificial. I wonder if it's fake. I mean, I just wake up thinking that kind of stuff. Well, here's the bizarre thing. I do, but most people don't. And maybe some of you do here on League Project. I'm sure some of you do. But what does that mean? So what's next? Let's say you guys all agree with me, or let's say 90% of you agree with me on this. And I've given you enough evidence to say, yeah, there's, there's no question. The moon is a crazy anomaly, and it is most likely artificial. Well, then what do you do with it? You just, I mean, are, are things still going to be the same? And look at this one. Here's another really cool image. This one is Mimas. And then here's the Death Star in Star Wars and Return of the Jedi before it gets blown up. And do you really think, I mean, look at that huge crater right there, okay, of Mimas. That just huge freaking crater. And then in the center of the crater, and this looks like an eight-pointed star. Or not, I'm sorry, not eight-pointed star. This looks like an eight-pointed shape here. A hexagon. Or is that an octagon? <laughs> an octagon. And then in the center of the octagon, you've got this huge ridge bump. Looks like an you know, enormous mountain protruding in the center of that. I mean, does, is that normal after a huge crater impact? That's totally normal, right? No, that's not normal. And then look at these. And I get the electric universe theory, and I think there's a lot of valid points in that theory on many aspects. Don't get me wrong. Wall Thornhill is awesome. I love that guy. He's amazing. And I need to get him back on the show because the Electric Universe, in my opinion, has many answers that the other model of the universe does not, you know, that many scholars and scientists look at. So I still don't agree with him on everything. I don't think this was made by an Electric Universe. I think this was made by very intelligent beings that know what they're doing. And they're probably the same ones that came to Earth and manipulated people and, and made people half goat, half human, you know, half bird, half donkey, uh, one third goat, one third kangaroo, one third elephant. <laughs> I mean, come on. This is, is this natural, guys, really? Look at the crater impacts like the ones there on the top you see that that looks like a six sided shape six or eight sided shape which means very well could be that tetrahedron truss type technology you know let's let me show you this right here uh tetrahedron truss greenhouse um Yep. Okay. So different trusses and different setups. You can you can do different applications and stuff like that. So I just think it's fascinating the possibilities, and I would like your take on this. Did the Anunnaki park the moon for a bird's eye view of their manipulation of creation? And I want to let you know also, if you go to Leak Project. Dot com. A lot of people say, Rex, I don't get all the updates on your shows that you do on your podcast, so I have to manually check. If you go to leakproject.com, you can actually sign up for free and get access to all the podcasts that are on YouTube. And plus, there's a really cool comment section. You can leave different comments here as well. People that are very in tune to specific topics without being there's there's not nearly there are not nearly as many trolls that leave negative comments. So it's a lot more beneficial for people that want to shift through that and just want to look at the, the positive aspects and possibilities. And also, there's a premium section on the website for exclusive members, you know, for premium members, this is exclusive, that you can download. And you can also download the rest of the podcast ad-free. You can listen via stream. And your contributions, 10 bucks a month or 50 bucks for the whole year, greatly help Leak Project and will help this project grow. 
And I'm hoping for here within the next six months, you know, having a mobile studio that I can travel the country extensively and have equipment to present drone footage, to present uh, better camera you know, footage, better film, and also talk to guests sometimes live and on scene instead of just doing it on Skype or on Zoom, actually talking to people in person. I think that'll add a lot to the shows as well. So, you know, it's expensive to be on the road. And I was thinking, what are some ways that I could come up with some monies to come up with this so I could share it with the world and share it with people that are followers of Leak Project and the cause. And when I say the cause, I look at the cause of Leak Project as being, it's a group effort. It's for freedom. It's for balance. It's for peace. It's for win-win situations. It's for knowledge. It's for thinking outside the box. It's for creating our own opportunities in conjunction with what's available and helping people wake up to their own fullest potential, which will help other people out in return as a byproduct, as a side effect. It will help people. How beautiful is that? And literally being the change you want to see, being the change I want to see, and imagine what it's going to be like 10 years from now, five years from now, heck, even six months from now. What is it going to be like tomorrow? What is it going to be like 100 years from now, 100,000 years from now, a billion years from now? What's wrong with thinking that far in the future? Because if you really get to that level where you start thinking outside of the box, what's, what is it going to be like 50 years from now, 20 years from now for your, for, your, for your family, for your future generations, for your kids, for your parents, for your friends, for your friends' parents, for your, you know, I mean, for everybody. At some level, we're in this together unless this whole Agent Smith thing is, you know, think about that for a minute. What if Agent Smith is really true and certain people are just, even though they look real, they, they do real things and everybody else sees them as real, you know, the functioning, blah, going out, being like walking zombies most of the time and just being a part of the system. And then you keep trying to unplug them, keep trying to unplug them. Once you unplug them, they just poof, they disappear. They're like, they were never real in the first place. <laughs> you ever wonder stuff like that? I'm just kidding you. But it's definitely far out to think about the possibilities. And certainly, I feel everybody listening right now is as real as it gets. And you guys keep me on my toes and keep me real. And I appreciate that. So question everything and be the change. Oh, wait. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. If you own a business, I almost lost track here. I was divagating from the subject at hand for a minute because I was getting excited about other things. I tend to do that. And if you guys can keep up with me, you're amazing. And I know you can. If I can keep up with you, that makes me even more amazing that I can keep up with you. But where was I going with this? If you own a business or if you have a, you know, um, a service company or something that would be a good fit for Leak Project and the listeners of Leak Project. If you want to work out something to where you buy Leak Project a drone and then I can help promote your business or you help with a trip for a specific story and then I can promote your business on that trip. And... If you have like a, a business or a service that you mentioned to me that I don't feel would be a good fit, then I mean, that's, that's, I'll, I'll let you know right off the bat because there are going to be certain things that I don't think would be a good fit for Leak Project. And you probably know that anyway if you've got a business, but certainly keep that in mind because not only is Leak Project reaching, over 100,000 views a day right now. It's growing very fast, and the, the views are just skyrocketing. So I think it'd be a good way to get new products and new services out there. I had a guest on the show a while back that is a CEO of a specific company that creates these products that filter out air. And he came on the show 
the you know very nice guy. He said he was going to send me out one of these machines that filtered the air. He never sent me one of those, but I don't know what happened. That's okay. But during the interview, he was talking about the technologies of these machines, and the video started to go viral. And everybody was like, hey, I want one of these machines. These sound great. And then the board from the corporation called them up and said, hey, take that video down. You can't talk about that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. So I had to take the video down. And then he, um, he, he apologized and everything because he was getting really deep into conspiracy stuff and the Illuminati, so I guess they didn't like it. But my point is, like, he comes on the show and starts talking about this product, and literally the, the podcast just, just starts flying off the hook. And that was when I had maybe... 10, 15,000 subscribers with Leak Project. It was a long time ago, and now we're over 100,000 subscribers. So, you know, think about that. If you've got a business idea or a, a service or a product that you feel is important and beneficial and would be a good fit with Leak Project, send me an email, guestbookings at leakproject.com, and, you know, we can work something out. So that's my shameless plug, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening. Really appreciate your support. Be the change you want to see. Nanny, 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 nanny.